Welcome to Case by Case. This is a podcast series brought to you by Luke Zadkovich and Callum Chain of Zyla Floyd Zadkovich. We're, we're into our second episode of our second series, and this is another uh, another instalment from our global retreat in Norfolk. How are you today, Callum? Very good, and excitingly, we have another guest with us today. Yeah, we, we've got Mr. Ed Floyd himself. The man himself. Well, I am excited as well and delighted to be joining both of you for this podcast. And as with all, I'm having a wonderfully enlightening time on this retreat. It's great to have you, Ed. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Well, we've, we've, we're putting Ed in the hot spot on, on an English, court, English law case. Ed spent most of his career practicing New York and U.S. law recently qualified as an English lawyer as well. So we thought, why not um, touch on an English judgment today? I'm not so sure we're putting Ed in the hot seat. Ed has the most recent law school experience of any of us on English law. Now, that's a very good point. <laughs> so we might just hand over completely to Ed. Jokes aside, we're, we're talking about a demurrage time bar case. So this is a maritime related case. It's a decision out of the high court of England from the commercial court. It's a decision of Mr. Justice Henshaw with the owners Euronav and the charterers Repsol trading for the for the um, the MT Maria. And it's an interesting decision, this one. I, we've ge- <laughs> the court's generated up to 20 pages on what time zone applies to a a, a demurrage calculation. So we'll we'll get into the facts very shortly, but I thought the same thing. When I first saw the facts, I thought this is straightforward and and not going to throw up that many issues. And then you start reading it and issue by issue comes up. It's a very nice judgment. It's very well written and it, it incorporates a, a lot of interesting legal issues from contractual interpretation generally to the way that we should interpret charge parties to periods of time in general, the, the time for a service of notice. There are lots of interesting kind of practitioners' points in this in this decision. I thought also includes some very interesting commercial or operational considerations. In particular, there whether the operational or commercial mindset should be focused on Greenwich Mean Time (GMT), Zoom Time, or on local time at the location of loading or discharge. In this situation, discharge, or whether some other time ought to be contemplated, such as the time zone in which owners or charterers' main offices are located. Exactly. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll just go straight into the facts now. The, so we have owners claiming demurrage and charterers arguing that that claim is uh, time barred. The, the, it, this is a, a charter party for a tanker. Um, the demurrage was $487,000 and it was discharging at Long Beach, California, right up to Christmas time. It was the night before Christmas and <laughs> <laughs> at, Long, at Long Beach, California at 2154 Pacific Standard Time, the hoses were discharged or disconnected, pardon me. How, how often though do we see cases or issues or legal matters coming up over Christmas or the Christmas period? Now, I know this went for 30 days, but, but still, so, so regularly something in and around holiday time can create these types of questions. And I wondered whether this, the, the, hol- the holiday period and maybe the kind of the, the late December scram- scramble to get out of the office caused some confusion. Then maybe things weren't recorded as quite they should have been. Yeah. Because in any case, you wouldn't want to leave a time bar until the minute before. So yes, that's true. But so often it is. And I think it's because, as you were mentioning, Ed, it, it's off, often an operational question, isn't it? So something happens, the data discharge is then recorded. And if it's not recorded right, it's not really revisited until you know, the day or two before when the notification pops up on, on the internal operation screen. Exactly. So what happened here was the, the hose is disconnected, completion of discharge at 2154, 24th December. But that, which is, which in the, uh, it, GMT would be around five or six a.m. on Christmas morning, which certainly when I was younger, five or six a.m. on Christmas morning was firmly Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
the question was, what time zone do we use for starting the 30 day time bar? And it was important because whether or whether you use the 25th of December or the 24th of December informs whether the, the time bar was, was the notice was given under the time bar on day 30 or day 31. And if it was given on day 31, then the claim is time barred. If it was given on day 30, then the claim is a good one. And that was essentially the question for the court to answer. What, what, what day is it, according to the charge party, when at, at 2154 Pacific Standard Time? Yeah, so it was all about whether you, you look at the computation of time from when the event that triggered the running of time when that took place. So the local time. And in this case, discharge happened in California. And if the time period ran from the local time, and that is when when discharge took place, 30 days from discharge, then the the, the claim was time barred. But if any of the other scenarios, so whether it was the time zone of the recipient of the required notice, here that would have been Spanish time, that of the charters, or alternatively, the time zone of the giver of the required notice here, that would have been Belgian time, that of the owners, or GM to given that the contract applied English law. If it was any of those other scenarios, then, then the claim was not time barred. And, and this struck me, I don't, I'm interested to hear your, your opinions on this. This struck me as straightforward. It was 30 days from discharge. So we're looking at when discharge finished. And discharge finished on the 24th of December, albeit 24th of December in California. So for me, this, was, this is on, on its face. And it does get more complicated when you start to look at the, the law around services of notices and some of the interpretation acts. But on its face, this was quite straightforward. The discharge finished towards the end of the 24th of December, but on the 24th of December. I think one consideration, though addressed in the decision, that makes sense to somewhat take off the table, and certainly I'm interested to hear if either of you have a different view of it, is that the court did not spend much time considering whether the concept of elapsed time, meaning 24-hour periods running from the date of a, from the time on a date of a particular event would apply. The court pretty quickly reached the conclusion that elapsed time would be completely inapplicable here because the relevant clause itself did not make any specific mention to a time. Instead, it referred to date and days, not hour of a day. Um, so I think it's notable to quickly take off elapsed time, 24-hour periods from the table. In my mind, that makes, makes good sense in this setting here, at least. Yeah, and I, I think you're right, Callum and, and Ed. I, I agree. I agree with the proposition in in this particular clause that it, it it's a it, it's a running of time from an event. It makes sense to look at when that event actually occurred, where it occurred. But you can, it, it, I, I suppose, from my perspective, I'm not in favour of the uh, the other two, where the recipient, the time zone of the recipient, or the time zone of the giver. To me, that that's one or the other. It's kind of you know you'd be preferring one over the other. So I don't see any good reason for either of, either of those. But I, I suppose the the neutral English law, you know, when you have you have a, a choice of law in a contract, and that often will set up not necessarily, but it often relates to where the matter is going to be decided as well. I and mean, you can look at these things as you know questions of procedure. I, I know that's not right, but there's a, there's kind of a natural tendency to think of these in, in terms of, well, what's the neutral position that the parties chose? And here, and here you'd say GMT. And where that may find some favour, I suppose, is where you have, let's say discharge occurred here. I think there was actually multiple discharge um, ports, but it was all on Pacific time in California. But imagine discharge occurred in two different states that were applying different time zones. You know, for there to then be this kind of moving, this moving time zone analysis as well, there's something that, that you can see, well, actually, if you peg it to a neutral time, there's some sense to that. Now, that's not the right position ultimately, but I can see the sense to it. And I also thought, and I think this is a good, a good way to get onto the law around services of notices, because I think that's interesting. 
for time, for, you know, for notices protecting time, but also for notices in general. But it seemed to me to be significant that what was required here was the service of a notice rather than, for example, service of process. And I wonder if you'd have a different analysis if it was a time bar of 30 days to serve a claim mm. and the claim had to be served in England. Then it would, to me at least, it would be stronger. The arguments would be stronger in favour of saying 30 days from, from the time, from, from the day, you know, the, the, in, the day on which English court would accept process, the first day, which was the 25th of December, because it was already that day at the time of the disconnection of the hoses. So I wondered if there was, if, if the fact that all, was, all that was required here as a notice was, was important. And that then I think leads on to the, to the law around services of notices, which, which I thought was really interesting in this. And go, on, go ahead. Before we get to that, and certainly I, I agree that the service notices law is quite interesting in this. However, I also had an initial question, which was whether this truly involved a question of law or if it involved a question of fact. And part of me thought that this is largely a question of fact, which would land on the conclusion, which is the conclusion that the court reached, that the triggering event occurred on December 24, as determined by local time in Long Beach, California. And I say that because the question is, what day is it? And the question of what day it is, is not a question of law. It's a factual matter, or at least there is a good argument there that it is a question, question of fact and factual matter rather than a legally determined matter. And, and the court does go through some statutes which have sought over the years to address timing considerations and to set time. Certainly there are laws in effect which set times, but ultimately what day it is, is a question of fact. And so from that perspective, it makes sense to look to the local time. I agree. I agree with that. And there are a number of, there's lots of case law, which they go through in this decision that, that reiterates the point that time is, I think it was one of the Australian decisions that said time is a local phenomenon. I quite liked, I quite liked that. And the other, the other case that I thought was very interesting was this Crown against Logan case, which I think was in 1957. And there was some new legislation, some new, some new legislation that came into force on a particular day. And I believe it was two soldiers were involved where basically did something that made them guilty of a crime under that new legislation, but they did it at 2.57 a.m. in Hong Kong. So the legislation was introduced in the UK at the, at the time at which these people had committed the crime. The legislation was not, was not yet in force in the UK. And the question was, are they, can they be guilty of a crime under that legislation? <laughs> it, it just it, it amazes me that that situation ever happened and that, and that someone had the ingenuity to run that as a defense. That, you know, they did, the, sure, we did the thing. We, we, did, we did the bad thing, but <laughs> we actually didn't do it when it was. It wasn't an offense yet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I thought that was, that was a good case. I like that Australian case, the, the, <laughs> the other one you're talking about, not just because of um, my accent, but there's this, this great line where it says, the, the birth of a man is an event. His attaining 21 is not, in the same sense, an event. It is merely a way of saying that a certain period of time, 21 years, has passed since he was born. The importance of this distinction will become apparent. And I think it's, it, it kind of really, it, it really kind of captures what we're playing with here is the concept of an event happening and then a running of time and a lapse of time and how those two interact. And I, I, I think it's, it, it actually takes you that, that the Australian case gets into it quite a bit. It takes you right into what is the concept of time. Now we could that could you know stray into conversation later on tonight, I suspect. But <laughs> it's, an, it's a nice point. If you're in, you know, having been born in Scotland, if I go to New Zealand, am I allowed to you know raise a glass at midnight on my birthday to celebrate my birthday, or hasn't you know, enough time has not yet passed yeah. for for me to in fact have reached whatever my age is at the time. So maybe it's my birthday, but I'm not yet that age. 
Yes, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, look, I thought that was interesting. I also wanted to touch on first principles because the the court did look at this as a contract construction matter primarily. And I, I think you, you're right to raise this question of fact, Ed. And they gave the, you know, a few sections of, from Wood and the Capture Insurance Services, this, the UK Supreme Court decision of 2017. Um, and then went on to quote some sections from Lord Hamblin and Leggett, with whom Lord Reed agreed in the financial or the FCA and Arch insurance decision, a very recent one in 20, 2021, also of the Supreme Court. And that was looking at an insurance policy and construing that as a contract. And the, I, I find we, we have this come up time and time again that Actually, it's so good to go back to first principles and think about what is the the process upon which you should be approaching these questions. And and, and I'll quote this. So so the, the core principle, like any other contract when they're looking at this insurance policy, is that it must be interpreted objectively by asking what a reasonable person with all the background knowledge which would have which would reasonably have been available to the parties when they entered into the contract would have understood the language of the contract to mean. And it, it, it's a different exercise to what did the party subjectively think. And so often we hear from clients, oh, well, I thought the contract meant this. And you, well, you actually want to leave evidence on that as well, when actually what was subjectively intended or understood is not actually relevant. It's an objective. And that doesn't apply to just, you know, a, a Demari Steinbach case, but it's a, it's a principle to reiterate for contract construction. So do you want to go through how the, the, the law was applied here? Do we want to touch on that? Yeah, I think, I think so. I think this might be a good moment now for me to get into the, the notices points. Yeah. Because that, as I said, I thought that was really interesting. So it's, there, the law is not entirely consistent on when a notice is to be considered served. And there are different cases that deal with this differently. So for example, there, there's, a, there's a case that suggests that service of a notice at, at 23.41 on a Friday is not giving notice on that Friday because no one would be anticipated to be in a position to receive that notice at that time. And that's, that's also been held to be the case with, with service of a letter on a Saturday morning under it was a, a real estate contract. And the two cases there, the, the Pamela and the case there called Right Side Properties. So but what both of those cases essentially say is that the, the time at which you, you have given a notice, there has to be some kind of reciprocity in the person who you were giving the notice to has to be able to receive the notice at that time or has to be understood as being able to receive the notice at that time. So you can't get away with simply sending a notice the last minute before a deadline, you know, one minute to midnight because you can't be sure that someone's going to be in a position to receive that notice and that puts you on an uncertain legal ground. Now, the alternative to that is, is the case called Afovos, Chipping and Pagnan. And in that case, the judge held that if, if there was a deadline for payment of hire, then the deadline ran through to midnight. And I think the distinction there is, is quite an interesting one because the a payment of hire, uh, no, one, no one has to be there to receive a payment of hire. Uh, if, if, if someone has to be there to receive a notice, well, someone does have to be there to receive a notice. A notice is sent to somebody, whereas hire is, is sent to a bank account. There's no, there's no expectation on a person receiving, you know, receiving hire and acting on it, if you know, if, it makes sense that a notice would be treated differently to 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 a payment. Um, and it's interesting that that's reflected in the law. Callum, do you mind if I chime in on that point? It is interesting that it's reflected in the law. I'm not certain that I fully agree with that perspective, though. To begin with, I think there is a legitimate concern for purposes of notice receipt if one reads into a contract an expectation notice must be received during ordinary working hours that is effectively would effectively be converting contractual language which refers to days or calendar days but more often than not to days into a reference to business days, which simply that is language which can be used, and I have routinely utilized it, seen in contracts, but which is used 
in this charter party. And so that interpretation is converting the reference to days into a reference to business days. Certainly for the last day. I think you would still, if you had a 10 day period starting on a, I'm going to get the, the dates wrong here. I'm not going to be quick enough at thinking in, in sevens. But if you, if you had a 10 day notice period starting on say a Wednesday that would run through until a Saturday, that's probably not correct. Then the first weekend would, would be, would be days. They wouldn't be, you wouldn't, you wouldn't change the 30 days into 30 business days, but you run to the problem with if you, if the final day for notice is the Saturday, then do you actually have to give the notice by 5.30 PM on the Friday? So is it in fact a nine day window? Hmm. And I think that, that is a concern, but it, it does seem to be the, the way the law is and the judgment quotes a chitty on this saying, if a notice must be received by a specified person, by a prescribed day, it must be received at a time when, as an ordinary matter of routine, it will convey the relevant information to that person or his agent, e.g. in the case of an office address during normal office hours, which I do find interesting. And I think it's a very important practitioner's point to be aware of. Yeah, but is that is that the case in like say arbitration procedure? You know, or, or or maybe I'm thinking, maybe in that situation, there's some arbitral rule that deems deems midnight as being the, the time when a, a time bar will be taken, like a timetable deadline will be taken until. So then, effectively, have a contractual agreement to what it is. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, I suppose that doesn't go very far, really. I, th- I think there are rules on in the CPR for where a deadline falls on a weekend. Yeah, there are. There, there definitely are. I think it then it pushes it to the next the next non yeah non weekend day. So that is taken care of for for some things. It it is a point of interest though for these commercial notices. What's the? It, it almost it seems like if if somebody has to receive the notice, then then your time for giving the notice you can't just rely until up to midnight. You have to you have to give the notice at a time where somebody's there to receive it. And the reason that's, the reason that kind of becomes important in this case is that does the, do do the owners truly have 30 days if their notice period starts at, if if, if they're taken to have received notice of day one at at 5am the next day, Mm. does that make sense? You, 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 you kind of lose the day zero. Yeah. I see that. Because day, you know, day zero is 24th of December and they've lost it. Normally you would, you would be able to have. Day zero and then time starts, but yeah, but they're straight into day one. And when that's bookended with the fact that they then also have to have to give the notice at the end of the period, do they truly get thirty days? I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, not in the in the sense of you know hours and minutes. I don't think they do. Well, because the, in the, on the one hand, you could say they do because they get until the end of thirty days California time, right? right. But then if you look at the way that Chitty's interpreting notices. They yeah. don't actually get until that time, California time, because they have to serve a notice at a time that is going to be received by right. the by the by the counterparty. And I found that looking at this case through that light, it it, it actually what seems simple starts to unravel and starts to become a little bit more complicated. And I'm, yeah, I I wonder whether whether there are arguments actually to say that to say that the the note the, the correct time for the, the correct date for a time to run or the correct date to consider is the, is the date of the person who's receiving the notice because they're the person who is, is important for giving the notice within the deadline. Well, that's certainly something that one could contract for and add via a general term and condition um, to specify that. I know that when I draft contracts, typically time zone for payments is something that I address as well as in regardless of what we stated in statute, what is the trigger event for determining that a payment has been made on a time basis? Is it the initiation or the receipt and contract around it? I sense the contract around it as well. Absolutely. And you can contract for you know, close of business for a deadline or you can contract yeah, for exactly. a time of day. You can create more certainty around these things through contracting for sure, but that's not always the case as we know. Um, the, the court also mentioned that in the specific context of charter parties, that there is you know, a favouring of the local time approach. So if you look at events such as the delivery of a ship or the payment of hire, there's both in Carver on 
chartered parties in dealing with delivery and also in time charters, they both favor a local time approach in, in that context. And the court makes the complementary point that applying local time would also be uh, in line with the provisions of the Hague rules and Hague Visby rules for um, the commencement of suit under um, Article 4 of the Hague rules. And I don't believe it's noted in the decision, but that would also be consistent with expectations regarding Article 3 of the Hague rules and the time for giving three day notice by cargo interests of non visible damage. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the owners tried a few other arguments as well. They got us straight onto the interpretation acts, but you know, that act applies to deeds and other instruments and documents. And the court really didn't, didn't see much persuasive, much that was persuasive in that. Although, you know, that was another three or four pages of the judgment. <laughs> and the, the one, the one other point they strayed into, which I think people like to use, especially where there's a time bar, but can be difficult is contra proffer, contra proffer. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a tendency to think, we'll just get the rub of the green if, yeah. we, if we're against the time bar because it's so, you know, the time bar is so, creates such a difficult regime for the person who's time barred. Surely we'll just get, you know, they'll kind of fall on our side. That's not really what contra proferentum is. Contra proferentum is where, is, is where there's something ambiguous yeah. that, and the court will then say, okay, we will decide that ambiguity against the person who's relying on the clause. It's not a case of we get everything to go a little bit more our way. Yeah, and it needs to be finely balanced as well. So there's an ambiguity and, and a fine balance in there so that it just tips the scale. You know, it's almost like the scale is, it has to be balanced <laughs> and not tipping one way or the other in, in its ambiguity. And then you just, you know, you get a, a little nudge, you know, against the, the drafter. But that's not the case here. And yeah, the court said that's not, that uh, doesn't apply in this, this context. And I get the feeling that judges and uh, arbitrators to an extent don't like finding that they don't know what a clause means. And that's what on yes. the referendum has, you know, yeah, that's what they have to find to ensure they're like to friend. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, should we, should we uh, wrap this one up? Who'd like to, to round it off? I, I think like if we, if we look at the conclusions, the upshot of the, de- of the decision from Mr. Justice Henshaw was that really the ordinary and natural approach is to allocate to an event the date that was current in the place where it occurred. And that's, that's really the primary finding here, and there are uh, a number of reasons for that. I think that's right. And maybe my, my, final, my final word would just be to, to throw, throw to Ed to ask him in one of Mr. Mr. Floyd's favorite phrases whether he has any saved rounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit of an in-joke uh, for the audience. Yeah, well, I, I think I will pass on saved rounds today. The only thing that crosses my mind is if a tree falls in the middle of the woods and nobody hears it fall. <laughs> but let's not get into that right now. Uh, the sound of one hand clapping and all that. Yeah, well, we've, we've, yeah, we've, we've touched on some interesting topics. I am interested to continue that debate on what is time and, and the concept of time. But anyway, thank you for listening and for getting to the end of this episode. We hope you found it enjoyable. It's, it's been great to have uh, you on uh, joining us, Ed. Thank you for your time. Always a pleasure, Callum. Cheers, Luke. And to everyone listening, please do uh, subscribe or hit like on our on our LinkedIn's promoting these podcasts. It really does help. Thank you. Take care. Cheers.